Am I in, in anywhere in between here? Perfect. How are you guys all doing today? Good. Awesome. Uh, my name is Jason Mendoza. I run My Rental Superstore. Uh, we're a power partner with uh, my home group. We focus on property management. Okay? Now, the class is not named property management because if it was named property management, there would be absolutely nobody here because that's not what you're here for. Uh, but I'm going to talk about uh, rental investments. Okay? Because uh, part of that, part of uh, property management is we're just managing for rental investors. Okay? Um, there are tons of them out there. There are tons of them that want to get in. And guess what? Anybody who hasn't got in and wants to get in, guess who they're going to look to first? The realtor. Start asking them naturally about rental investment and uh, you know different rental properties and things like that. Okay? So we'll talk a little bit about that today. Uh, we're going to touch on a few different things. Um, myself, I'm a former My Home Group agent. Okay? I was, I think, the ninth agent here. So, I mean, way back when Mark and Jeremy had a spot over off of university before they even moved into Club and Construction, where his, uh, where the office in Tempe was for a while, way before this place, hey, uh, came about. And so, um, after a while, I ended up starting uh, my rental superstore because I needed it because that was just the nature of the business for me. Um, I flipped houses, I still do here and there. But the majority of my thing now is to focus on rental investment. Um, and I also own 28 rental properties in the uh, greater Phoenix area. Okay, So that's what kind of got me in here. That's what uh, got me going on all this stuff. Okay, Before I get going, has anybody got any questions? Anything, anything hot off the top of their head? Anything that's burning you? Anybody giving you any tenant scenarios? Anything like that that you want to know about right now? Hmm. My neighbor's trying to evict the tenant. And... Uh you know, they kind of know that uh, the landlord's hands are kind of tied and the process is going to take forever. Okay. Why is that? Uh, Why do they know the landlord's hands are tied? You know, that's a good question. All right. Excellent question. You know, that's what I think, yeah. Let's start with that, guys. Let's talk, let's talk real quick about eviction real quick. Yeah. Anybody from out of state? No? You're all here from Arizona? Awesome. This is like one of the best states ever to be a landlord. Okay, I'm from California. <laughs> Evictions in California, minimal six months. Oh, a lot of times, no. nine months. Oh, I mean, no collecting rent, nothing. Just your stuff. That's the landlord's hands are tied. Hmm. Okay? In Arizona, you're late on the fifth, or you're late on the first day, I can send out a notice. By the fifth day, now with the fifth day, if I sent my notice out, if I want to do it myself, I'll go down to the courthouse. I will file that, get a court date for the next week. Okay, now we're about day 12, 13. All right, get a judgment because this is basically how it goes in the court. Judge calls you up, plaintiff, landlord, you know, I'm sorry, defendant, you got your, you got your tenant. And, he, and it's, it's something similar to this. Okay, let me see the paperwork, blah, blah, blah. Okay, tenant, um, says here you are, uh, you're late this month on rent, $500. Did you pay the rent? Well, I, uh, no, I asked you, did you pay the rent? Well, this guy didn't do all the, I'm sorry. What I asked you was a direct question. Did you pay the rent, yes or no? No, judgment for the plaintiff. You need to pay this man his rent, or next week with the sheriff, he's gonna get a writ and you're gone. That's it. I mean, that's literally it. Now, if you have done it before, like me, a bunch of times, it's piece of cake. Even if you haven't, as long as you show up with the right documentation, it's that simple. It does have to be the owner, or it has to be an attorney to handle it. Okay, now whatever scenario they've got going on there, who knows? There could be a million different things, breaches and other sorts. But if it's if it's something where the tenant is saying, you know, the tenant's claiming something, they haven't put it in writing, landlord can just go in there and go, eviction, goodbye, you're out. It's that simple, okay? Makes it really big for us as landlords because it, you know ultimately what we're doing is these are investments, okay? We're not running charities. <laughs> we, we just, that's not the deal. We're running it for investment. And so the key is is that we need the renter to pay every month, okay? That's where a company like mine would come in and that's where we're on. We monitor them, we take care of it every month, make sure that they do pay those rents. If not, notice just go out, kick them out, get somebody new in, okay? Other states, you have a myriad of things that could come in. Like, um, I, I know somebody from, I believe it was Vermont, and they were telling me from October through May, nothing you can do. Why? Weather's too cold. 
He's kicking kick everybody out. Oh my God. Well, we got a similar thing, opposite thing, right? It's May through uh, October. Judges don't care here. But get out. Which is fair. I mean, ultimately, at the end of the day, you have a contract with a renter. All right? Your job as an owner, as a landlord, as a property manager, take care of repairs and things like that, right? Their job is to pay the rent on, in a timely manner. And so if that contract is breached, that's the best thing about Arizona. That's what makes being a landlord here so great. Okay? So that's uh, that's like our first start here into uh, rental investments, okay? What if they don't have a contract? If they don't have a contract, what are what are leases in this state if they are not written? Verbal. Implied? Mm-hmm. Verbal, mm-hmm. verbal, good way to put it. Okay. That works. You can have a verbal le- lease up to how long? Who remembers this? One year. No, you can have it up to one year, oh. right? Okay, so let's say you have a verbal lease then. Verbal lease. You just have a 30-day notice. Get out. Here's a five-day notice. You're late on the rent. That should, you know, again, that should hold up. You got to get everything in line. If you're, if you have any kind of doubt, then I've got a couple of great people, great resources, attorneys that you can go to. One in particular that will handle all that for you. Cheap too. Any idea what an eviction costs here in Arizona? Ninety dollars. Ninety dollars, a little bit more. One fifty. Yeah. One fifty plus another fifty plus another fifty for the sheriff. Yeah, it's roughly three to four hundred dollars. Mm-hmm. Believe yeah. me, any other state could be thousands. How long does it take the sheriff to show up once they got that eviction? So, so okay. So we get the judgment, right? We get. Let's say we get the judgment on. Back to my original scenario. We get the judgment on the. Uh, let's say it comes around the fifteenth day of the month. Okay. We we were we were diligent. We got everything out. We got the judgment on the fifteenth day of the month. It'll be anywhere from five to seven days after that. You will get a call from the sheriff. So I could be on day 22, maybe day 23. Sheriff's going out there. Knock, knock, knock. You got one hour. Get your stuff. Maybe less. Depends on what the depends on uh, the mood of the constable. Sometimes I've seen him tell him, get out. You got five minutes. Get your stuff. Really? So you don't have to show back up at court and say, oh, yeah, the tenant didn't get out? Uh, no, because you're, gonna, you're just going to have the sheriff come with you. And you're going to come with either your own set or your handyman or whatever. Change the locks. Change the locks. Right, tell them, right. get out. Get both the place up. Tell them, get out. Now. Yes, sir. Sorry. Uh, what happens to their personal property? So their personal property, how long do you have to store it for, guys? Oh, yeah. For 30 days. 21 days. 21 days. 21 days. Okay. So we have to store it for three weeks. All right. Now, you can you can store it on site, or you can move it all out and throw it in a storage unit and basically go, here's the storage unit. You can go do what you want to do with it. Whatever catalog everything now. What about the cost Video. of storage? You can you can you can uh, make them pay for it. You can make them pay for it. Okay. Now, will they? I don't know. Um, so th- there comes the the, the um, catch twenty two. So look, th- in theory, you could video everything, catalog everything they got, push it all into one room and leave it on site. And then if they don't come pick it up, it's yours. Throw it all away. All right. Um, you could also take it, stuff it in a storage unit, pay the, you know, depends on how much they, how much they have, 59 to $150, pay it for, for those three weeks, those three weeks are up, go over there, take it out, throw it in the dump, and you're done. What well, if somebody part of front yard? What if somebody, <laughs> what if somebody comes in and steals it? <laughs> yeah, you're, you want to make sure that it's secure, because that's where, that's, where that's where your liability comes in, okay? So remember, if you do it and you leave it on site, Remember, make sure the building is secure because if you don't and somebody breaks in and they take the stuff, then you're in trouble. Now, reality, what do they usually leave behind? Garbage. Yeah. It's usually garbage, trash, yeah. things like that. Okay. Um, me and my team, we have a way of, of writing that into the lease and making sure that that's already covered. So we'll go in there, deem, deem it of no value and throw it out. Okay. But that's, again, something that I've learned over the years and whatnot. But yes. You do have to make sure that you take care of their personal property and store it for that period of time. Yeah. So then after the 21 days, could you sell their items? You can sell the items to recoup some cost. Yeah. The re- yeah. And then keep the receipts and whatever. So keep the catalog, etc. It's your stuff at that point. At that point, it's your stuff. They basically, you've, you've fulfilled your time frame mm-hmm. and now becomes yours. And a lot of times it's, you wish they would have just gotten it. Mm-hmm. Um, anyone know? How like okay? So let's say I evict, let's say I evict, Sir, what's your name back there? Mark. Mark. I kicked Mark out of my place. Mark, 
Um, you need to make arrangements with me to come get your stuff. How In those 21 days, how many times can Mark make arrangements with me to come get the stuff? One time. One time. Mark can call me one time and go, I'm going to come get my stuff. Great, Mark, I'm going to give you this time. We designate it. That's it. If Mark doesn't come get all this stuff at that time, then legally at that point I can start to enforce my right to get rid of all of it. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, no. At that point, I am no longer under the obligation to make a time with him to do it. In those 21 days, if I still, if he can meet my now time frame, then I could go back and do that. I still got to keep it for the 21 days. But I only have to give him one appointment. Beyond that, it's now on my time schedule for him to get it out. Now, more often than not, I want Mark to come get his stuff. Because guess what? It's more work and more hassle for me if I need to go and throw it all away. If I can get Mark to come by, just take your stuff out of here, that's better for me. Okay? So it's always a little give and take. It always depends on what you are, are um, trying to accomplish. Okay? So we'll go through a few of the, the situations there. All right. We'll talk about a little bit today, better understanding of investment properties, how to identify a good property, how to speak a little, a little lingo with your clients, and then recognize, recognizing opportunities to make commission. Okay? Because ultimately, you guys are agents. You want to make commission, right? Most amount of sales possible. That's ultimately what you want to do. So hopefully what we can do is put a couple other little golden nuggets, tidbits in your, in your tool belt here that you can go out and sell to your clients. Okay, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right, outstanding. All right, number one, first quick tip that I like to give is every single person that you run into that you sell a house to could potentially be a three sale deal. Okay, a three commission deal, all right? So average customer, let's say we get a listing, right? Great, listing, sell the house. Let's say they wanna buy another house, okay? Outstanding, buy, sell. I mean, sell, then buy, gotcha. All right, so we do that for our, for our client, right? If structured properly and everything, like let's say for instance, somebody, they have a $100,000 house, they sell it, and they upgrade $200,000 house, right? But let's say they, they had 100,000 cash and they sold it for cash, they took it and they put part of the money down. Let's say they put $50,000 down on the house, on the new house, got a loan, they got another 50,000 sitting there. So what could that potentially be? Rental. A rental. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. A lot of people will do a technique as they're starting to move up. What you do is you move into a property and um, you buy at FHA. Everybody's familiar with FHA, three and a half, lowest amount down, right? If the market's increasing, you could potentially, you know, let's say your house just goes up in value and you sell that house. Well, once you sell that house, you're under no obligation to take all that money and go put it down in somewhere else. You could take some of that money, you could just go, hey, you know what? I'm just gonna take three and a half percent, I'm gonna buy it in your house and upgrade there. And I keep doing that. I could in theory I could continue to do that. And that would leave me with a lot of extra money. Now what are we worried about? Well, if we're constantly buying and selling, possibly capital gains uh, and things like that, right? But if it's my personal property, if I've lived there for two out of the last five years, do I got to pay any gains on it? No. Now, always consult with your tax professional. But right now, the way the law reads is that all profits that you get up to 250000 or up to 500000 for a married couple, you can keep without having to pay gains on it if you've lived there for two years, okay? Those laws, do they do change and everything, but that's there right there. So theory, theoretically, get that money tax-free, put 3.5% down on the new house, and now you got all this extra cash. Why not buy a few rentals, okay? All you gotta do is plant a few seeds there, and there's, those, uh, there's that opportunity, okay? So you try to take that and just guide them a little bit. Um, they say in real estate that our job is to protect the public from themselves, mm -hmm. okay? You gotta constantly be looking out for them, what's in their best interest. Well, how do you know if it's not in their best interest if you don't present a rental possibility to them, okay? So that's always a possibility. One thing that I was saying, and I don't really invest a whole lot in the stock market or anything like that, do you know why? Mm -hmm. No, well, <laughs> let me tell you, because I am I don't have a Series 7, I don't have a Series 6, a 63, I don't have any of that. I'm not a licensed financial advisor in securities. What do I am? What I am is a real estate broker in the state of Arizona, which says that I might know just a little bit about property, right? 
So therefore, I invest in what I know. Rentals. And that's why I have a lot of rentals in my portfolio, because it's what I know. Okay, it's what I know, it's what I would, you know, some people would say is my area of expertise. Therefore, as real estate agents, you have a little bit of expertise there, a little bit more than going, hey, I've got this stockbroker, I've got this financial advisor over here to put it in their hands, which I'm not saying don't do that. I'm just saying you guys as licensed agents are already walking down this path and you've got a wealth of knowledge here at my home group, um, a lot of the power partners and stuff like that, so you can utilize this as tools to help you, you know, um, do things for your, for your clients. A rental investment and, and whatnot over time, should you pick the right one, should be a good deal for your client, okay? It's just all a matter of picking the right ones. All right, so we wanted to convert all those leads into sales, and how are we gonna do that? Well, we're gonna do that by having knowledge, right? Um, people buy properties from their agent for a lot of different reasons, right? I can tell you sometimes people buy it because they like the person, they, uh, you know, maybe play uh, softball with them, they're their drinking buddy, this, that, and the other. But one thing that is, Universal, when, whenever anybody's looking for an agent, one thing that, that does help you is always having knowledge. Because we all know there's a lot of new agents out there. There's a lot of agents that may or may, you know, they may be brand new. They don't really know, you know, a whole lot and whatnot. And the one thing that you can always demonstrate is you can demonstrate knowledge, right? So for, for our purposes here, knowledge of, of being able to have different aspects of the market, all right? We, we, we know how to sell a regular single family house, okay? Oh, it's beautiful, it's got this, that, the other we market, it, right? When we start talking about rentals, it starts to change because the people that are looking at rentals, they're not looking at it like, oh, I love the neighborhood, I love, you know, how beautiful the sink is, the faucet, the, cat, the, the um, refrigerator, stuff like that. It's, what kind of cash flow can I get? Or is there an opportunity for it to go up in value? Is there a bargain there? What may that be, all right? So for, for our purposes today, rather than go into much bigger units and things like that, let's keep it simple, okay? Let's keep it simple for what we want our people to buy. Anybody can get their ha head around single family residence, a house, a condo, a townhome, an apartment, right? A duplex, <coughs> two units. Triplex, three units. Fourplex, four units, okay? Very simple. Now let me ask you this. Why do, I, why do I stop there? Why don't I go to five, six, eight, 10, 12, 100 units? Because there's no name for them. You can't get commercial license. So you need to go, come. there's a whole lot of answers there. So the deal is yes, <laughs> you can't get residential financing on it. You have to go commercial financing on it, right? Mm -hmm. So not everybody is, not everybody's adept. Not everybody has the cash to do conventional. Not everybody has the wherewithal to do, I'm sorry, commercial. But residential? Every, pretty much everyone can get their head around there. Anyone can go in and apply for a loan and get that done. Okay, so let's keep it. Let's keep it simple. Let's keep it here for now. And then you know, at a certain point, you grow beyond this. Then it's hey, you're going into a different class, and that's probably going to be Aaron Dutry that's going to teach that. One. Okay. So let's talk about some basics. Okay. Uh, everybody knows area. Everybody knows uh, selection. Uh, the selection area and type. Okay. Do you make money or lose money? Why is that super important when you're picking out a rental? Very basic, very common. Cash, com cash, cash flow. Yeah, you don't want to be losing on a monthly basis, okay? I will tell you right now, I've done I've done this for a long time. My first rental was in 2013. I've had negative investments. I used to be a loan officer out in California when the boom was going out in the 2000s. I mean, it was it was crazy. Money was hand over fist. It was it was ridiculous. So you would we would invest and buy these properties, and they're losing three four hundred dollars a month. Okay, didn't matter. No, it did matter. Okay, because long term, I will tell you this: um, real estate is not a short term investment. It is a long, slow burn, and stuff happens. Okay, anybody who I've ever dealt with, and I've sat down with and talked with, and going, okay, I'm going to open up my playbook. I'm going to tell you what to do as an investor. First things first, you're gonna put money down. Let's let's say you put 20% down on a property, okay? And let's say right now, triplexes, fourplexes, they're going for 250, 300,000, all right? So let's say, let's say without even covering closing costs and all that other stuff, 50, 60 grand that you're gonna put down of your hard-earned money, right? And I'm gonna tell you the first thing, six, first six months, don't expect to see a dime on it, okay? Don't expect to see a dime, because everything that can go wrong mm -hmm. could possibly. So be ready for it, 
all right? And what that means is what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna structure the deal for you. So that way, hopefully you'll have some positive cash flow, all right? Hopefully somewhere between $600 and $1,200, all right, a month. And just expect that that money's gonna disappear every month. And, uh, and I'll tell you why. It's gonna be, this tenant has this problem. This tenant has that, but all of them want to test you. They wanna test me as a property manager and see where I'm gonna go. Sometimes there are a lot of legitimate repairs. They just happen. More importantly, let's say you don't have any of that the first six months. If you're smart enough to take that money, just put it aside, you have a high, high propensity of never having to put any more money into that property, okay? Because it starts to cover itself. If every month you're just kind of not counting on that cash, just putting it back in, it will <coughs> build. It will do what you want it to do, but if you don't have your makes money column, if you are not positive every month, you're gonna have issues, okay? Because look, first, things, first thing that can happen, even after all that, tent moves out. Guess what, there's vacancy. Still gotta cover your mortgage, okay? So you gotta prepare for all that. That's why you have to be very, very careful. You wanna give yourself enough margin to make sure that you're gonna make it in the early going. Um, condition of the property, real important. Home inspection every time, just like, on a, just like with somebody buying for their own personal use. Make sure they get a home inspection, unless if they're a professional investor, but throw it out there, do your disclaimer, hey, I recommend you get a home professional home inspection. See what you're looking at, okay? Um, also, everybody has a different goal. I, I will tell you this right now. Every property owner that I deal with, and we are close to about 400 units in our portfolio, every single one of them is different, okay? Everybody's got a different goal. Some guys are like, I just want to take get money every month, all right? Other people are like, I'm buying it, I want to sell it in a year. Cool. Goals change, but you want to ask them, what's your goal? Okay. Are you looking for, you looking to make money and keep it simple for yourself. Always keep it in very simple terms. You looking to make money month after month? Are you looking to pay it off? Are you looking to buy more? So what is your goal? Okay. And then what that goal translates into, there's a couple of things, two real different, two, two easy school of thoughts that you can kind of partition to them in, and then you can break it down from there. But some people are, I mentioned it before, equity players, okay? These people are just saying, hey, I want to buy the building because I think the market's going to go up in the future and I want to sell it for that. Nothing wrong with that, okay? To me, a little riskier, but nothing wrong with that. This is what I do. I do cash flow, okay? I want monthly residual, all right? And I'm looking at it from a standpoint of going, hey, I want to be able to say that I'm going to get X amount of dollars this month or this year. And next year I'm getting X plus one. And the year after that I'm getting X plus two because the rental market is gonna keep going up. It will have its dips and whatnot, but just like just like the real estate market, it will always go up at a certain point. It will have peaks and valleys and things like that. But right now, because we've had, uh, we had stagnation in the rental uh, market for so long, now we're seeing great appreciation in the rental uh, rates, okay? So you can kind of project it out a little bit. This is the other thing I would say on that. Don't count on it, okay? That's just that's just cherry on, the cherry on top. Because if you could just say, hey, if I've got a unit, let's say I've got, I buy a house. I just buy, very simple. I buy a house, $1,200 a month in rent, and I'm, and I'm, let's say my total, everything out the door. Um, principal interest, tax and insurance, my mortgage, and then my property <coughs> management is $800. That means I'm $400 positive a month. Okay, if I can project that out 30 years, I'll just stay with that. I'm gonna be in good shape. Okay, if I just stay on it, keep it rented out. The reality is, is that rent should go up, should go up, and you should be able to make more and more. Then you have a decision to make. Do you want to start paying it down? Do you want to stockpile some money and then maybe buy buy another one? Okay, every single one of them is different. Just ask them what the goals are. It doesn't really matter but it just makes you, you know, just be aware, ask questions, write it down. And that way you have that, you, you start to get that, um, that buy-in from them because you, you're paying attention to what they're saying, okay? High risk versus low risk. Um, anybody anybody uh, buy bonds or do you know what junk bonds are? Junk bonds, okay. Junk bonds in the stock market, they are low rated, but they pay a very, very high yield. They might pay like 20, 30%, things like that. You have, um, Properties, C-class properties, and they're in the lower, neighbor, lower neighborhoods and whatnot, they will pay you a lot, a lot of money on returns. However, they got high risk. 
because there's a lot of turnover. There is potentially, um, you know, there could be crime in the neighborhood. You could have a lot of turnover, all right? But high risk, high reward, low risk, low reward. It just depends, okay? It depends on what your, what your <coughs> client's looking for, okay? Again, some of the goals, long-term, short-term, okay? Cash flow, portfolio building, extra side money, okay? Just different simple goals that people uh, may have while they're looking to build and buy investments. Okay, what you're always trying to do is just pique their interest, okay? In any kind of sales job, we agree that basically real estate is a sales job. So anytime you're doing a, a sales job, you're always just trying to pique their interest, okay? You can't get a sale if you don't ask. If, if you may not know, there may be anyone could be in, interested in rental properties, but if you don't ask the question, you'll never know. <coughs> just pique the interest. Have you ever thought about buying a rental? Has it ever crossed your mind? You're gonna sell this house. What are you doing with the money? Have you thought about investing in buying a rental? There's so many good things with rentals that you can do, especially when it comes to for tax benefits and whatnot. Okay? So pique your interest. Alright. So real quick here, understanding a good rental versus a bad rental. Alright? Area, pretty straightforward. Tenants. Now let me tell you a little bit about tenants, okay? Tenants can be great. They can be a lot of times they can be an absolute nightmare. All right, they really, really can. Um, my company, what we do is we screen very thoroughly for tenants. All right, it starts with credit and background. All right, something that we have access to. Uh, it then goes to employment history. Uh, we're always looking at that. Then we're looking at rental history, trying to get a full scope of it. Um, as an individual landlord, I know people that do it a lot of different ways, but what I do is I do that. There's all kinds of different standard rental qual qualifications that you'll hear out there, like three times the monthly rent. Um, we, in our company, we go into um, their rental history, lab, no evictions in the prior five years. Um, we look into that employment history, try to get all that documentation because tenants can be a million different things. Sometimes they look really good on paper. You bring them in and they're just nuts. It just, it can happen, okay? But if you get, if you do inherit a building or you buy a building and you've got a solid rental history from the tenants, that can be a good, that can be a good thing, okay? Cost versus rents. Um, a good rental will have hopefully very little maintenance that needs to be done on that. Now that all comes from the beginning. It's just like when you're buying, that's when you're really gonna know, go through, look at the water heater. Have them, and that's where you can really rely on that home inspector. Water heater look good, roof look good, AC, any visual uh, evidence of leaks, things like that. Stuff that, stuff that you would, would look for. You wanna have those low costs. In a, in a good rental, you're gonna have low costs. If you can get a, and it's, believe me, I've, I've represented a lot of buyers and sellers, uh, almost none of them have um, an income statement or profit and loss that they hand over. And these, these are smaller, these are smaller owners. So they generally don't have them, they don't, have, they don't hand it over. When you start talking about doing commercial buildings, you'll get all that stuff, plus a pro forma. Okay, but that's a different class. Um, good rentals, there'll be amenities around it. Parks, close to shopping districts, things like that. All right, your hidden costs. Um, one of the things you got to look at if you're going to be looking into buying duplex, triplex, fourplex, something like that with your with your clients, one thing that a lot of people don't consider is water garbage and sewer. Water garbage and sewer is, is something that's customarily paid for by the owner, and so that's going to be an additional cost that's going to be in there. So you want to build that into your um, you know into your um, game plan for that. All right, all right. So a little bit about the lingo cap rate. Everybody remember that from real estate school. Mm -hmm. Net operating income divided by market value. All right, I don't, I, cap rates neither here nor there when it really comes to me. What I really look at is was ROI, return on investment, okay? I can look at a cap rate on what the building is worth and this at all day and all long, it doesn't matter. Here's what really matters to me. If I put $50,000 down in a building, even if I bought it for 200,000, how much money am I making on a monthly basis based upon the 50,000 that I put down? It doesn't really matter what, you know, US bank loan be. At least to me, it doesn't matter. What I'm more interested in is how much money did I put down? What return am I getting on that cash? Okay, that's my true return on my investment. All right, cap rate is more based upon what you know, what what the neighborhood is doing and everything else. Now you can look at that if you're looking to sell. It becomes a lot more important in commercial and and outfits like that. But on a day to day out basis, ultimately you want to know how much return am I getting on my investment. ROI, return on investment, and that's basically what cash did I put down, 
And what am I getting back on that every month or every year? Okay. All right. So that's your cash on cash return. They're basically the same thing. Monthly net. Anybody know what that is? Put yeah. Expenses. All your expenses. Yeah, absolutely. PITI, water bill, repairs. Um, if I've got a home warranty, a lot of people will get a home warranty in the first year. Great. It's in closing. Guess what? That still goes in your expenses. Pay four fifty for that home warranty divided by twelve. Okay, because that's a monthly expense. You want to know what's that monthly net that I got to cover every month. The reason I like buying four units is, you know, obviously residential financing, but it gives me four times the rent. Right? It also gives me four times the problems. Right? But think of it this way: if I have if I have four units and I got one that's unrented, right? I got three units, three out of four. 75% still coming in. Even with a triplex, one goes unrented, I still got 66% of my rents coming in. If I got a single family home, yeah. one goes unrented, I got zero, yeah. okay? So I look, like to look at it from that standpoint. It is something that you have to graduate to, okay? It takes some time to get used to as, as um, investors, you know, because the single family houses are gonna be a lot more stable. However, a lot more upside when you get more units, okay? All right. Cash flow, that's your that's your monthly, you know, uh, what you're making every month. All right, now a cash cow, cash cow, basically what it means. It means you got a rental, like you got a rental, and you are just getting a lot of return on it every month. Okay, um, my first, I like to tell this story. My first rental that I bought was in Sacramento, California. I bought a duplex up there in 2003, and. What happened was, is I had an opportunity to buy a fourplex, but I didn't know anything about this stuff back then. So I buy this duplex, it's in a rough neighborhood. Um, you know, we were maybe $100 a month positive. Didn't know a lot about it or whatnot. But if I would have known now, what if I would have known then what I know now, I would have bought that fourplex. That fourplex was an old Victorian home and they were selling it for 179,000. And it was two bedrooms, two bedroom units all around. And I could have probably gotten, back then I think it was, the rents were about $700 a piece, okay? So I would have bought an FHA, moved in, 700 bucks a piece. You know, 15 years later, basically, I would have paid it off. I was talking to somebody the other day up there when I was in Sacramento. Each one of them was renting for about $1,500. $6,000 gross, even if you count in California taxes and everything, it's $5,000 a month. That's a cash cow. Okay. Exactly. Because I would have bought an FHA, so it would have been out of pocket maybe eight, ten thousand dollars, and I'd be with five thousand every month. Ring, ring, <laughs> ring. So it happens, you know. It's it's you don't know what you don't know, and at that point I didn't know. All right. Um, luckily times have changed and things have happened, and you know, uh, a few years back I bought one in Glendale, and that one is gross is about twenty eight hundred a month, and my my output every month is about. 1300 a month, it's a cash cow. Yeah. And so they, you, they happen. Yeah. And when you get that opportunity, you jump on yeah. it. So <clears throat> at what point is it better, better to keep the financing in place than to pay off your mortgage? Mm. Depends on what your goal is, depends on what you're trying to do. Uh, let's, say, let's say like, for instance, my game plan. My game plan will be to keep the financing in place, and then as I approach, um, you know, probably about 55, 60, that's where I'm going to want to pay them all off and try to reduce reduce down the liability for myself. It just depends on what you're trying to do, and then and then you got to think about this: Does it make more sense to pay it off, or do you take that money and go get another one? Right, that's what I'm saying. So I, I guess the thing there is, is that at what rate, you know, at what you know, I guess it's expenses, right? It's your expenses. So which how much cash flow are you willing to give up? To that's all. Borrow, borrow that money at four percent. Yeah, that's what you got to think about. Is like, are you and, and think of it this way: if you're borrowing money at four percent, let's let's take this to what the bank does. If I'm borrowing money at four percent, why am I going to pay it off if that money I can make 10 12 percent on? Right. Don't pay it off. And if you can deduct that towards your income. You know, you're deducting, you're deducting the interest. You're, you're, yes. interest. You're, dedu you're deducting mortgage interest, correct. Right. I mean, if you pay it off, a deduction goes. Right. So you so have to kind of factor all that in. Money. Yeah. Right. Yeah, you've got to factor all that in. But then again, at a certain point, and again, it, it just depends on where you're at in your strategy. 
at a certain point, you may want to just go, you know what, I don't care. I just want to get it all done so that way I've got this cash flow every month and I don't have to really work. Okay, and everybody has a different game plan of where, how it works and whatnot. But simply, the bank, they give you maybe what, a couple, 1% on your savings right now, if you're lucky? Well, they're out there. They're out there moving that money around mm -hmm. and making. You know, I, I bet you they're making 50, 60, 70 percent because they're just buy and sell. They've got really smart guys that do that. They're doing it with your money. Mm -hmm. I took a class recently. It was kind of more geared to commercial investments, but they said stay leveraged high as long as you're making money because then you're less liable for lawsuits. If they know you you own a property free and clear. Lawyers are going to be like, chain let's take them to court. You know, if there's problems, of course. Yeah. But if you're leveraged high, there's not much left where they can sue. Right, right, right. Now, and again, that that's going to be a completely different animal because, I mean, in something like this, you're going to be, a, it's a much smaller investment. I, I would always recommend this too. Once you get, once you get situated, all right, let's say you buy an investment property, you buy a couple of them. What you're going to want to do at a certain point is you're going to want to start to divide them up and start putting them in LLCs or trusts. Yeah, yeah. or trusts. Yeah. Yeah, wouldn't, you, wouldn't, wouldn't you have that? Wouldn't yeah, you, yeah. Wouldn't you develop that. Let All me right. tell you. Let me tell. Okay, yeah. Potentially yes, but potentially not because guess what? You may. Let's say you buy. Let's say you buy a fourplex. This is what I tell every person that comes out of, out of college or high school or whatever in your, in your first purchase. Buy a fourplex and move in there for a year. Do it, do it, because you can get it with FHA, and you can turn right back around yeah. and buy another one with FHA, because you're going from a fourplex or a duplex or a triplex mm -hmm. to a house, they'll do. They'll let you do that every time. And you can keep that loan on there. But what you're gonna wanna do is you're gonna wanna refinance that loan. Mm -hmm. So you wanna get your financing structure correctly. So you may be, you may originally buy it with FHA, so you don't wanna put it in that LLC until you've basically um, purchased the other house, Refinance this one. This one's now you go to conventional. But you get it to the point where you have twenty percent in there. Now you got it in conventional. Now you can take it, t take it, tuck it away, and you're sitting good there. So you can't put that FHA into a trust. You can. Or an LLC. You can, but you're going to cause yourselves a little more, a little more problems with refinancing it, especially if you put it in a trust. Trust's going to be a pain in the butt. Figure that out. LLC. Yeah. So that, uh, you can do it, but game plan. But a trust is a lot more, you're protected with more with the trust than you are at LLC. Can't yeah. answer that one for you, man. <laughs> that's, a, that's a whole that's different bag, bag of uh, ball of wax on yeah. that. Yeah. But see, again, this is liability, yeah. risk versus reward. So you have to game plan. This is this is all a matter of kind of playing a little bit of chess yeah. with it. If you own if you own the property, you clear and put it in trust. Yeah, right. right. But if you don't, you <clears> just <throat> operate out of the LLC, that way you're still liability is less. less yeah. Solid. If that college person you're talking about in this example took your advice by the age of 30, my God, they could probably have, who knows how many properties, yeah. five properties, they could have 5,000 positive cash flow maybe. You could know. be sitting, you could be sitting in really good shape if you, if you <laughs> use that little, I mean, if everybody would have known that back in the days, I mean, yeah, it, it's a great opportunity to start and go with. It's got to make sense though. So look, you can go from, you can buy a fourplex, could you buy another one? Maybe, maybe not. It's just gonna depend on the underwriter. It's gonna clear it for you. You definitely can buy another house. Yeah. But then what you can do is you can, if you're paying that fourplex down, you could refinance it, harvest some cash out of it, and then buy another one. So a lot of different ways you can do it. And it's basically starting from three and a half percent down. Start there, and then go. And there's a lot of programs out there that are even as low as you know one percent down. There's stuff that's out there. It has to make sense though, guys. You got to do the numbers because if you go in there. And you're going to be negative, or you're going to have a lot of issues. It's not worth it. Yeah. Do you have any uh, experience using retirement funds, self-directed IRAs? I do. I have one, and I have used it before. Okay. So like yeah. people can, and that's how I always think about it, is if people were aware, you can market that as a niche. Just take your 401k, put it in self-directed IRA, Absolutely. and then you it. Well, no, not necessarily. Um, you got to you got to research that. You got to make sure that they'll let you do the down payment. A lot of them, or a lot of what I heard was. You can take that money, but you gotta buy it free and clear. Free and clear. Yeah, so make sure you're make sure you're yeah. clear. Stuff keeps changing with it. Yeah. So I don't know a hundred percent, but I mean there I, I use some and I did a completely different technique with it. There is money there that can be used, especially if somebody has an opportunity and you know they're not happy with their investments, then it is a great vehicle to use.
Okay, because then you can qualify money, and the money all has to go back through there. Yeah. So you can't touch it. Mm -hmm. You can make it, but you can't touch it until you're, you know, whatever you take out. Yeah. So keep that in mind. Okay. Real quick, property classes are simple. A, B, C. Okay. A class, Scottsdale, Chandler, nice places, mansions, things like that. B class, you know, okay neighborhood, working class neighborhood, you know, things like that. C class, it's rough down there. There might be, you know, drug neighborhood, things like that. A, B, C. Yeah. Real, real straightforward, okay? But if you're talking about it, just you can eyeball it. Just eyeball it. A, B, or C. Okay? Here's the value add. I love this one. Come on. There it comes. No. Bam! Most people see a complete teardown. Alright? I see a value add. I see an opportunity. If my if my subflooring and everything is intact, mm -hmm. I might be able to get in there, do a little bit of work, mm -hmm. and I got myself a rental, especially if I can get it very cheap, okay? Value add, fixer up, if you will. Okay. Cash cow. This is actually my property in Glendale. I just added this slide in there today. This thing is a it's a monster. It just keeps going month after month. It's brick built. Brick builds are great, man. Mm -hmm. You know, same kind of thing. All two bedrooms all have washer dryer hookups in them. Mm -hmm. Try to not provide washer and dryers to do hookups. People will go get their washer and dryers. A washer and dryer, if you put it in there, just you becomes one more expense yeah. potentially. <laughs> now, if you got a nicer property, you might want to do that. But a lot of them, you know, anything under, I, I think anything under about 2500 I'm just going to wash dryer hookups. And the renters will bring them. They'll find them. Okay? Um, and this all has storage, like storage on the back of them. This was, I was very lucky to get this one. Yeah, okay. And they're few yeah. and far between now. Yeah. Cool. yeah, it sucks. It's tough out there right now. But it will come back. Okay? All right, so we can't all have this right off the bat, mm -hmm. but sell the vision. Mm -hmm. I, I'm telling you, I've told a couple of my investors and I've watched them. It becomes like playing Monopoly after a while. Mm -hmm. It's just, I have one guy that he's got about, I think he's at 70 units here in Phoenix. And he was like, he had me sell a couple of buildings last year. And then the other day I'm on the phone, he's all, I, this deal came across down in Yuma. And I'm like, how much? He's 150000 He's like, I couldn't pass it. I'm like, you can't. It's too good of a deal. He had the extra cash, and he's like, I, I just, I, I have to. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm like, I told you. It would be like playing Monopoly. But it just, it takes time. But eventually it gets there. And you, you, it's fun to watch. It's fun to watch a couple of the investors get it. And then they start to go. And then they, like, go and they raise more money. And, they're, and you're just like, you're like, wow. It's incredible. But it's, it's awesome. It's all because you just plant a seed. Sell the vision. All right. After the sale, what do you need to know? Well, you made your commission and everything, right? But they're still going to come back to you. They're still going to come back to you. They're going to be looking to you as a resource. We always say in real estate, be a resource. Okay? Make your sale and everything, but continue to be a resource for them. So the basics you need to know, just a little bit about property management. All right? You don't know how to do all of it, but you need to know the, the basics. A couple things. There's always going to be a monthly fee. All right? There's going to be a monthly fee. Like my company, they, we charge 8% of the monthly gross. If you're 1000 bucks a month, it's $80. All right? That covers everything. The reason I do it like that is I like to be real transparent with it because I'm an owner. I told you. I got a bunch of, of investments myself, so I get it. I want to know as an owner, how much can I pencil that cost in for every month? All right? You got other companies out there that will do flat fees and things like that, and guess what they do? Nickel and dime you to death. There's an overage on this. There's an overage on that. Every time you turn around, uh, we try not to do that. Renner's Warehouse? Renner's, yeah, possibly. <laughs> <laughs> I won't say. <laughs> so anyway, uh, yeah, so people do that. Um, remember I'm talking about preparing financially before? That six month, put six months aside? Remind them of that. Tell them, be a, good, be a good agent. Do the right thing and tell them, hey, look, you just bought this. Don't touch that money for six months. Make that your cushion. Believe me, this will be the best thing you ever do. Because the day, the day and time is going to come when you're going to get hit with something hard. And that extra money can make the difference. All right? Because the one thing you don't want to do is be writing a check out of your own pocket. Going like, oh, crap. <laughs> Roof's gone. I wasn't ready for it. Boom. Here we go. One thing that we try to do is we try to do as a, as a property management company or that we do do is we do an annual walkthrough. And we go through, we meet with the tenants. Anything that we notice there, we report back to the owner. Hey, you got deferred maintenance here. You got this issue. You've got three years left in your roof. Water heater looks bad. 
You need to get that, that information to them so that way they know what to do. All right? Going back, going on with that, what to expect from a rental. That goes back to what I said. Six, first six months, put money away, stockpile, be ready for stuff. Um, everything that I've ever bought, I've always maintained a $2,000 minimum. Okay? As a property manager, I only require that, I require that my owners keep $300 with me in my trust account for incidentals, okay? I gotta fix a doorknob, then I need, I need to be able to draw some of your money to fix it. Otherwise, you gotta send me money. Well, guess what, that, that drains from you, time. I've learned this, that time is your most valuable commodity. It's the most valuable commodity. So, if you don't give me the $300 and I gotta call you, you gotta send it, it's just wasting your time. Why not just leave that money with me? Anything under 300, let me do my job. I got a network of repairmen. I got a network of contractors and things like that. We'll, we'll try to get you the best price for it. Let me do my job. Trust me that I know what I'm doing and my staff, we know what they're doing and we'll take care of it. That way you're not getting the call on Sunday. You're not getting the call on Saturday. You're not dealing with any of that stuff. Believe me, it's worth it. Um, so we have, we usually keep that, but I tell, this is going back to what I'm saying. As an owner though, I go, look, I'm keeping 300 year dollars, you keep 2,000, because it's gonna happen. The day's gonna come when it's like, AC's out, home warranty's not covering it. So guess what? Need to, need to figure something out here. And it's gonna be four or 5,000, now great, I'll, I'll give you options. But you need to have some money to put aside that. And if you're running thin on everything else, it gets really tough. You know, you don't wanna eat into a lot of your savings. So we'll, we'll try to figure a, a you know, a way, the best way for you, but have that money available so that way it's just your safety net, okay? And that's for every rental, for every single rental you have. Uh, even my people that have big portfolios, I'm like, every single one you should have $2,000 just set aside for it. Just set aside, ready to go, just in case, okay? Um, general lease terms, uh, we use a standard AAR lease. Go through and look through, do yourself a favor, just read through one, it's very simple. It's very, very simple, looks, you know, um, there, there, there's basic things in there, I mean, easy terms. Um, what the rental rate is. Uh, anybody know about transaction privilege tax? Mm -hmm. TPT, sales tax, yeah? Yes. Yep, it sucks, <laughs> I hate it, guys, I hate it. It's, it's BS, I wish yeah. they would get rid of it. Believe me, it's a headache for me and my guys because we file it for everybody every month. Basically, every city in the state of Arizona charges you a rental tax, or charges the renter a rental tax. What we do is we collect it on behalf of our owners and we pay it out for them. That's huge. Yeah. That. Yeah, and it's a nightmare. Do you, do you carry the license for your we owners, used to. or do they have to we carry it? We used to. The, in 2017, the state of Arizona yeah. decided we were going to make everybody get their license yeah, and do it that way. They, they, mm. they tried to do it for realtors. They yeah. were starting to kick down on us. It's a, it's a disaster, guys. It's, yeah. it's so much of a pain in the butt. And the thing is, is that they made it so cumbersome, but one of my guys does it. And so, does the whole thing for everybody. He's got it kind of down to a science. Yeah, and you, um, you know, we got people that pay uh, monthly, we got people that pay quarterly. I, I know some investors, they just pay yearly and pay taxes and penalties on it. Uh, but the crazy thing is that every city charges a different rate. And before, every city would collect. Now the state decided to take it over and it is a, dis no, it's a disaster. It's a disaster because they have just a generated system and it just kicks out bills and stuff and they don't know anything that's going on. So it's a mess. But anyway, um, it's in there. We cover it in there. You cover um, pull safety. You cover a lot of different things, lead-based paint. One of the other things too, if your owner ever buys a rental, they need to fill out spuds. Or if you ever have a rental, fill out the spuds. There's a renter, renter's owner's lease. Some, it's, a, it's a renter's spuds. Mm -hmm. Fill it out. Turn it up. Okay, we just had a, I just had an incident recently where um, one, of my, uh, one of my clients, the tenants, was claiming that something wasn't disclosed. And luckily we had the spuds. We're like, yeah, it's disclosed, okay? Um, but I've seen it happen before where it's like things are not disclosed and they're like, well, what do I do? You've got, I've got a lease, I've got this, and I'm like, do you wanna be right? Or do you wanna potentially go to court over this? Like, you got a lot more to lose than the renter does. That's what, that's what you gotta come down to. As a, as a business professional, as a realtor, as an investor, you always have to ask yourself, do I have more to lose than who I'm going up against? And is it worth it? If it's not worth it, give them the money back and move on. 
Okay, I will tell you this, if you do evict somebody, you've got about a 10% chance of collecting a dime out of them. Yeah. And it doesn't matter, believe me. Get them out, get it re-rented, move on. Write it off as a loss on your taxes. Loss of rent. Tell your guy, hey, vacancy. But you will, you, you almost always will not get anything from them. It's just, it's how it goes. Okay? Good thing is, is you won't, they won't hold you hostage for eight months. It's one month. You just move on. Okay? All right. Difference between good and bad management. Uh, bad management, got high, fee, high fees, high vacancy. I took over a building a couple of, uh, wait, no, let's see, January. And the owner was like, I have two vacancies and they've been vacant since August. And I'm like, what's the problem? I go over there and I'm like, yeah, it's not a great triplex, but I mean, I can get it rented out for you. And we did. There was, there was issues with stuff not being cleaned up, you know, the, the, and the property management just, they, they didn't want anything to do with it. They were just like, yeah, they were glad. They're like, here's a check with their security deposits. Go, move. And I'm like, I mean, it's not that difficult, but bad management will, will leave the vacancies. They'll also churn you, okay? So turnover, turnover is just that, that turnover you can get annually. We want to try to find tenants that are going to stick around for a while. Some companies will just turn it over constantly, 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 constantly. Um, I don't do that. Like we do make a commission. There's a, we charge a 4% leaching commission. Standard is six. Mm -hmm. So I'll charge less than that. Think about that, believe me, you can ask any one of my guys. They would rather not take the 4% so they don't mm -hmm. have to go out and do it. It's a lot of work for a little bit of money. Um, if you've got a 12, let's say you've got a, uh, a $1,000 rental. That's $12,000 a year. The leasing commission on that is $480 for us. For somebody else that's charging 6%, it's like 600 bucks. And then you gotta pay Cobroke? Come on, who wants to do that? No way. And that's why, and, and it's, it's crazy because a lot of times people will show rentals and stuff like that. I tell that, I say this, if you are new, do some rental showings, do it. Because it's great practice for showing your clients for sales. After a while, you will be like, oh, forget it, man. I'm, I'm not taking a $200 Cobra, 150 three, forget it, no way. So turnover is really bad. So, and it, it's just, it's more work for us. It's bad for the owner too, because loss of rents and having to do that. Large repairs, um, you'll, you'll have management companies that they will have a repair override, so they'll see that bill run up as high as they can um, because they're going to get a little override on that thing. Junk fees, um, I've seen people that charge administration fees monthly, so it eats into the actual amount of rent of what a owner can collect. Okay, No response, no explanation on anything. That's what bad management's going to be. Obviously, good management's going to be the opposite of that. Low fees, 100% occupancy, low turnover, higher profit. Long-term tenants, uh, as an owner myself, I want somebody that's going to nest. That means they're going to stay for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, averages you about 18 months. We just take it all the average, about 18 months. So if I can get somebody that'll be three years, then we've done a pretty good job. Okay? Do you HUD right a little? I'm sorry? Do you deal with HUD rentals at all? HUD. Oh, HUD rentals? HUD guaranteed rental, but lower? We have two of them right now. So yeah, potentially. It just depends if it makes if it makes sense. Um, we have done Section Eight. Uh, I don't. We don't do it a lot right now. So we just don't have to. The rental market is red hot. Yes. So there's no need for us to do it. But if we ever did, we we can do that. It's not that hard to get signed up for Section Eight. Mm -hmm. But remember, they're they're going to guarantee, you know, a large percentage. But the renter still has to come up with it. And you got to think to yourself, well, why is this person on Section Eight? Hmm. Think deeper than that. There's always another level, but sometimes it can work. It just, it may or may not. All right. Um, when you're evaluating a property to make a rec recommendation, can we cover ROI, cap rate, equity versus cash flow? This is the one thing on this on this screen. Just never percent, never promise a return. I can tell you right now, you can't. You need a securities license to promise any kind of percent return. You can project, perform. This is what I think you could get, give or take. Just never promise it. Okay, you always just do the math wrong, you know. And then if you let's say let's say you're you're getting them ready to buy, all right? They get a loan officer that's involved. That loan officer is going to calculate out that that PITI. Okay, your job then will be to look at a couple of things. How much could they potentially get in rent? Or just look on the MLS. Do a do a um, a market evaluation for them. Okay, just quickly ballpark it for them. Give them a range. Go, hey, it could be this, and then tell them keep in mind. You're going to have um, potentially some utilities, water, garbage, and sewer if it's multi-unit. Single family, I would generally wouldn't have them do that. Single family, though, I, if they have a pool, always pay for pool, have the owner pay for pool service. And if landscaping, depending on what it is, you might want to have them pay for landscaping. 
Okay? So you just got to factor that stuff in. Just eyeball it. Look at it. Go, okay, well, you might have this. And then you can kind of look at it with single family houses. Maybe tell them, you know, just consider that you might want to put away maybe 30 to $40 a month for repairs. Okay? Yeah, go for it. So, uh, full service, may I ask why would you have the um, owner pay versus the That is an excellent question. Because tenants, because tenants will never take, take care of that pool. <laughs> yeah. I ran a pool business for 12 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Best advice in the world. Her house house, she really shouldn't have children. She didn't want to put a gate. Oh, she didn't put a gate? Tell her. And I, I tried to tell her, but we're not, we haven't spoken since oh, okay. October. Well, that's her, that's her problem. Listen. Yeah, because she listen. didn't want to listen. And Pulls she, up. She, yeah, Pulls a huge her. liability. A massive yeah, liability. Two things. One, never, never, never let the tenants uh, take control of the pool. Okay. They will turn it green like yeah. that every single time. Mm -hmm. no, okay. You haven't talked to me since October. Yeah. Without <laughs> calling the city of. Phoenix. Do not do it, guys. So do not do that. Just tell your owner, hey, look, it, it's probably going to be about a hundred bucks a month. It's Best money you've ever spent. Mm -hmm. You you won't have to worry about your filter going bad. You won't have to worry about the pool guy's going to tell you what's going on. The tenants yeah. will they will destroy yeah. it. Yeah. You will. GI yeah. Joe will be. Stuck in the in the filter, it will explode. It just a lot of stuff can happen. Okay? Yeah, don't Yeah, it'll go green. It'll automatic. Yeah. Green is just the least of your problems. Yeah. Yeah. That's an automatic. It's going green. Yeah. But and it, and it's so simple to take care of. Yeah. Tenants do not care. Yeah, do not care. Yeah. Um. So yeah, absolutely that. And then landscaping it just depends. I mean, you've got some people that have really nice places, really, really well done up. I need to send somebody by to do the landscaping and whatnot. If you've got an HOA mm -hmm. in that front yard, you might want to have them come by and do that. Just that calculate that little extra expense, okay? If you can find a place that has no HOA and a zero scape in front, that's what you're looking for in a rental. You want a zero scape, you want no HOA, no pool, no pool. If you can do those things, just limit that liability as much as you can. Four bedrooms. Four bedrooms, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> whatever bedrooms, yeah. But you just want it. You want as the little least amount of moving parts that you can. Okay, so that's uh, that's some of that. Um, opportunity. Just remember, the opportunity is always there. You just have. You don't have to be an expert on everything. Mm -hmm. You just have to plant seeds. Mm -hmm. You got a lot of people around here that can help you out. A lot of a lot of different avenues that you can turn to. And so you have these opportunities. Our, our job is just to give you opportunities to make more sales, mm -hmm. okay? Obviously for me, I'm a property manager. Believe me, we will take care of it and whatnot. We will be happy with any referral we get. And my job here is to be a resource for you. Mm -hmm. And I talk about this stuff all day and all night. I field questions from people I've got. I got a lot of agents here who manage their own property. But when something comes up, they call me. They'll email me. They're, hey, I'm here for that, man, no problem. You know, because I, I don't want to see anybody have any kind of issues with their tenants or get taken for a ride. Tenants, oh man, they love to threaten and say this, that, and the other. And you know, uh, my admin is usually the one fielding the calls or some of my agents. But every now and again, they'll get through to me, and I'll be like, okay, sure. go ahead, tell me. Yeah, all right. We'll look at all that. No, yeah, sure, take me to court. Yeah, absolutely. You're right. Oh, oh, wait, you're gonna you're gonna quote landlord tenant act to me? Okay, cool. Sounds good, right? Yeah, no, I'm. I know exactly what section that, that isn't coming from, but sure. <laughs> and they do it all the time. They do. They, they love to, everybody's a certified paralegal, and then you sit there and you read it, and you're like, yeah, the uh, landlord tenant act doesn't say anything about that. And, you know, you got a broken door handle, and it's been 24 hours. So legally, I'm under no obligation to respond to you even for five days. I mean, I was going to call the handyman right now, but yeah, you know, maybe I'll just wait for the five days. <laughs> but that's the thing, they will, yeah, go Don't you yes. make them do, don't you do a home warranty and make them pay the service fee for the home warranty? Depends. It, it, costs, it costs you a lot of less headache because they won't be nickel and diming you because they won't want to pay $65 for all these nickel and dimes. It depends, because here's the deal. Some, home, some homeowners will pay for it, some don't. And then the home warranty doesn't always cover everything. So it depends on what the repair is. So, for instance, going back to the broken doorknob, um, I, you know, I can tell my owner, hey, I can send the home warranty. They're going to be sixty-five dollars, or my guy can go over there and he can, you know, on his route, probably fix it for about twenty bucks. So it just depends on what comes up. Now, if it is something more, something bigger, water heat, water heaters leaking, home warranty, absolutely send them. You got a drain issue, something like, send them, because you could potentially get a much bigger savings. So I tell people, in your first year of any property, yeah, get that home warranty. 
a little bit of insurance there. Then you get your feet wet with the property. Then you might be more like me, where like, ah, I'm not gonna pay for a home warranty. But it's because I have a network of guys and I can send them out cheaper and I can get it done for less than the home, less than paying all the home warranties on my building. You have to graduate to that stage. The immediate thing to do with, with most of your clients first is start them, start them slow. Hey, buy a condo. Buy a condo, buy a house. It's not gonna, you're not gonna, you're not gonna, you know, get rich. win the World Series with this thing. Yeah. Okay, but you're gonna saw a little single up the middle. You're not gonna get rich. You're not gonna be Rockefeller overnight. But you know what? A couple extra hundred bucks. If you make two hundred dollars every month, two hundred dollars extra for just doing a little, taking a little bit of risk, doing a little investment, that's nice. That's twenty four hundred dollars a year. And, you know, you could maybe shoot down to Cabo for the weekend, stay in the all inclusive with the husband, wife, whatever. It's not a bad deal, you know. Or you could start to stack that money up, but it's just a little bit. A little bit of risk and that big reward that will come there and that and that's the thing I've had many people do this they graduate they go from single-family home next thing they come back and go I want to get a fourplex I'm like okay now let's sit down we're, we're, we get this right and then we, we start on that road and I'm like okay I'm ready for the phone call the phone call comes where's the money it's like you got two guys that haven't paid yet Don't worry. I told you just trust me and you know I watch the boat go like that and I'm always like yeah, don't worry it'll be there and then about six months in, they're like, cool, I get it. I see the money keeps coming. It comes time, it comes, you know, a little bit later in the month, but it keeps coming. And I'm like, you got a lot saved in the bank? Yeah, you got money saved in the bank. So now you can withstand all the stuff. Yeah. And do you like getting more money than you did on the single family? Oh yeah, I like that a lot more. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, so I told you. And then comes the, I wanna buy number two. Cool, I buy the second. And they start to get a little addicted with it, which is great, because it's for their own good. Do you do short term on Airbnb? I don't do any Airbnb, I don't do any short term. It's just not in my, my game plan. Okay, I do know a guy who does it. I may eventually go bring that into the fold. Right now, I'm a more long term solution. Okay, um, with Airbnb and everything like that, a lot of moving parts. You got people in and out and stuff like that. Your liability is completely different. Okay, you're running more of like a hotel situation, but you got personal belongings in there. You got, there's a lot of stuff, and then what if stuff disappears? Plus, you gotta get cleaning, you gotta get repairs, and if you're turning nightly or weekly, it's a lot, it's a lot to do. Now, from an investor standpoint, it's great. If you can get one Airbnb and do it yourself, cool, do it, but hey, my hat's off to you. It's a lot of time, a lot of effort, but it's worth it. It's worth a lot of money if you can do it, if you get it in the right spot. However, it does eat up your most valuable commodity, time. It's a lot of time. It's a huge time commitment. That's the biggest reason why I don't do it. I like to do, I like to get our stuff and I like to set it, get it going long term. And believe me, we don't have a lot of time on our hands because we have a lot of repairs and things that come up. We get the Sunday night call for you. We deal with all these different things. Um, but, and it, believe me, it's a lot when there's a big portfolio of it. But um, with Airbnb, it would be impossible. Yeah. Yeah, you, I need so much manpower to do it. Mm. And I would, yeah, I'd already be dead. There's no way. <laughs> no way, guys. <laughs> so anyway, um, so you always want to uh, increase your, your balance sheet when you're looking at, let's say you, you run into somebody who has a rental, right? And they come to you. You're their friend. You're their agent. Hey, I got this management company, and this is what's <laughs> going on. And you're looking at their financials, and you're like, holy crap. You got a lot of stuff going out, Okay. You got, you got a lot of junk fees. You got things like that that are coming out. They're taking this, that, and the other for you. What you want to do and what we try to do is we try to increase our balance sheet by reducing those junk fees, getting rid of them. We're always trying to get them the highest rents. Okay. And then one other quick thing. If you guys ever get a rental, do not ever do more than a one-year lease. Okay. One-year lease is standard. Here's why. You can screen for a million different things. A million different things I can screen for. But I cannot screen for, and I'm not talking clinical, I cannot screen for crazy. Okay, not clinical crazy, but just people that are nuts. And here's the thing, you can get stuck with those people and they will make your life hell. But guess what, at the end of that year, get out, goodbye. If you're stuck for them, believe me, if you're stuck with them for two years, they're paying their rent, you are stuck with them, it is hell. Yeah, and it can be, and they will make your life hell. Some people just are like that, they're really- How do you get them out on the basis of crazy? <laughs> No, you can't get about that. You just don't renew the lease. You just go, I'm sorry, 30 days, I'm not renewing your lease, get out. Yeah. However, somebody that wants to hang in a rental for a while wants a longer lease than a year. Most people will take a year. Yeah. Almost everybody that I know will take a year. 
So we haven't lost, we haven't lost, I think we've only lost like one person who was like insisted on it, but then we just rented to somebody else. We don't get a lot of people that will, will balk on one year. Under a year they'll balk. They'll be like, oh, I, I, I want at least a year. Okay. The thing is too, though, is that, think about it. You work for your owner, right? And what your owner wants is your owner wants to be able to increase their rent every year, annually. And that's the thing. It's a business, okay? I go back to what I was saying before. It's not a charity. It is a business. You're, you're, the, the duty that you have as a realtor to your owner is to make sure that they can make the most amount of money possible, on it, right? Now, if you're, the, if you're the tenant's broker or agent, then yeah, you want to try to come from that angle. No problem. Do that. But the thing is that most owners and my clients, I work for them. So I got to advise them. Do one year. Give yourself that opportunity. Okay? I, I, I can't take away the opportunity from them. Their opportunity is one year and then see where we go from that. Some tenants are great tenants. If they're good tenants, and that's what I'll tell them sometimes too. If you're a good tenant in the first six months, then maybe the owner will extend it right away. But let us find out. Because we don't know you. All we, We've met you for 48 hours, a, a week, whatever. So we will give you, we will start there, but that's our standard. Is we go one year and go from there. Some of them go six months. They go, hey, can we do six months? That's what we'll do. That's our minimum term, is six months. Other people will do other things. It, that's just not uh, how we do it. Okay? Makes sense. Anybody got any questions? Yeah. And then do you go with another written lease after that first year? Or do you go verbal? No, no, no. You go, you go written lease unless if they're going month to month. Okay? If they don't want to sign up for another year, you can go month to month at that point. Okay? You can let them go month to month and kind of go from there. But you want to go, you want to, if they're going to go for another year's term, yeah, put in writing. At that point, remember, you also do have some, some responsibility to the tenant as well. Okay? So, hey, you want to sign up for it? That, that locks you in. So, you got an option. And sometimes what we'll do is we'll tell the tenant, you want to go month to month, it's going to be $50 more a month. You want to lock in a lease, lock in on a lease. But, you know, ultimately, I got to look out for my owner. And my owner's telling me this, what would you like to do? That's now. Because the rental market's hot, sometimes it changes. Okay, sometimes it may be where the the uh, rental market is really soft. You gotta incentivize them to stay. You gotta lower security deposits, things like that. That's not the case right now. You just have to make an uh, we make an adjustment as a property management company. If you're an owner, you make the adjustment. You just have to adjust to the to the market. Okay. Um, let's see. Part of what we offer: owner portals, tenant portals. Um, online payments and distributions, virtual leases, video walkthroughs, tenant evaluations. Try to keep everything like moving forward. Okay. Back in the days, we'd handwrite leases out. Mm -hmm. You know, whatever. We still have people that will drop off rents. We have um, a location here, a location downtown. Um, I still get like one person that mails it in every now and again. Mm -hmm. uh, but for the most part, most of our people pay online. We distribute online. Do things like that. Everything's kept for our owners that way. Try to use as much of the technology at our fingertips. To make it as uh, user friendly as possible. That makes sense. All right. So that's us. So one thing that we do, we, we I will tell you, as a my home group agent, if you do refer anything over to us, we won't poach them. They're yours. All right. I manage for them. When it comes time to sell, I hand it back to you. That's your client. All right. My job is to try to look out for you guys. All right. It's a symbiotic relationship. I want you to be able to have a good uh, relationship with your client. Mm -hmm. And then additionally, I want them to have a good relationship with their property management. There can be nothing worse for you than to send them to a property manager that just completely destroys it because that's what they just did. Kind of ruined your relationship with them too because you referred them there. So keep that in mind, okay, as you're, as you're going forward. All right, you can get us at MyRentalSuperstore.com. We're on Facebook. Phone number's there. Um, email MyRentalSuperstore at gmail.com. That's it, guys. I got I got nothing else. Anybody got, anybody got any questions? I'll be around for a little bit. If not, wait, wait, wait. I'll bring it back. Yeah, feel free to call. Whatever. I want to thank you all for coming today. Enjoy it every time. You do?
He's a Washington Lateral Retriever. That's the same Lateral Retriever. So, I'm going to really just motivate me and I'll shoot him over your way. Okay. Let me give you guys some cards real quick. I'm sorry. Yep. Yeah, that's what they're if that's what they're looking to do. Yeah, I got a lot of absolutely. There you go. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming. Yeah, absolutely. Where you from? Oh, oh wow. Oh man. Oh my god. 32nd Street to 24th Street. Okay. On my dad's side. Where the University of Phoenix is. My mother's father owned two blocks of that. Eminent domain. Oh my god. And then as you were speaking, Sacramento, well, Kevin Johnson. Yeah, the mayor? Well, he adopted, so we're family since he adopted my cousins. Oh, okay. From South Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, so, yeah. That did. did you ever live up there in Texas? I never. I haven't been a native. But yeah. There so was a, really uh, well. there's a neighborhood up there. It's called mm -hmm. Oak Park. Now it's like yes. all rejuvenated. It was, it was rough yeah. back in the day. Mm -hmm. That's where I bought my first duplex. And, oh. Well, you, I'm going to go home and find my son. All right. Somebody Sounds good. If you have any questions, right. email me, call yeah. me, whatever. Yeah. I'm always here. If you ever get any, I'll email you because if okay. you ever hear something and you're not, don't want to buy it, please shoot it my way. I will if so I can okay. find some yeah. these days. Okay. okay. Thank you. You're welcome. I'll take a little bus for you next week. Okay. Okay. You want us, you know, four bucks and two bucks is, you know, smaller unit. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What? Um, but I but I've got a search set for him. Does he have 